The International Court of Justice tells Israel to allow supplies into Gaza, saying famine is setting in there. But its previous orders in the war have so far been ignored. So what's the significance of this latest ruling and can it help Gaza's people? This is Inside Story. Hello again, I'm James Bays. It's not just bombs and bullets killing Palestinians in Gaza. Starvation is now claiming lives in the barbaric conditions imposed by Israel on 2.3 million people trapped in one of the world's most densely populated areas. More than 32,000 Palestinians have been killed and over 75,000 injured in almost six months of relentless Israeli attacks. Now the entire population faces danger too from hunger and a lack of basic medicines. The situation is worsening so fast that just weeks after previous orders, the International Court of Justice has made new ones. They direct Israel to allow aid and food supplies into Gaza and stop famine from spreading. The decision by the court's judges underlines the increasing isolation of Israel and its staunch ally, the US. But Israel's ignored the court's previous rulings on the war, as well as a UN Security Council resolution for a ceasefire. So what difference will the ICJ's new orders make, and will they be of any help to the people of Gaza? We'll be discussing all this with our panel of guests in a moment. But first, this report from Umwi Kulsan Sharif. It's a long walk for a bowl of food or soup. Mohammad Mahmoud Abdul Al hopes he won't return empty-handed. He and his family in northern Gaza are trying to survive on lemon, pepper and water. The situation here is very difficult. There's no food or drink. We move from place to place. We have been without food or drink for the past day. Our houses and schools have been destroyed. Our neighbors and loved ones have been martyred. When I go out sometimes, I fear I won't come back. Tens of thousands of Palestinians across Gaza are in a similar situation. It's prompted the International Court of Justice to issue new measures, ordering Israel to immediately act to address the catastrophic humanitarian crisis caused by its war on Gaza, and to open more land crossings to allow desperately needed aid into the Strip. ICJ judges said the Palestinians in Gaza are no longer facing only a risk of famine, but that famine is setting in. The order is legally binding and the court has told Israel to take all measures to ensure unhindered humanitarian assistance to Palestinians in Gaza. The new measures are part of an ongoing case brought on by South Africa, accusing Israel of failing to uphold its commitments under the 1948 Genocide Convention. In January, the ICJ ordered Israel to guarantee humanitarian assistance to civilians in Gaza. I think uh, it is clear that this is going to be a key aspect of the discussion for South Africa going forward. This is potentially what might make or break the case in terms of like how do you decide whether genocide is happening, is going to be this whole debacle of denying aid to, to Gaza. Aid agencies accuse Israel of severely restricting supplies of humanitarian aid into Gaza with lengthy security checks, creating crippling shortages of food. Supplies can only arrive through two border crossings. Israel has been widely accused of ignoring the ICJ orders made in January. We haven't seen any change after this resolution on the ground. We haven't seen any impact in uh, the, the people's lives uh, there every day. We haven't seen any impact in our uh, uh, ways of delivering the humanitarian aid. Despite the United Nations Security Council calling for an immediate ceasefire, the Israeli military continues its assault on Gaza, further crippling aid supplies. A UN experts report this week has also accused Israel of genocidal acts in the Strip. The ICJ has asked Israel to report by the end of April on all the steps it's taken to abide by the new provisional measures. In the meantime, Palestinians like Mohammad Mahmoud Abdul El face a daily battle to find food and to survive. Umikul Sum Sharif, Al Jazeera for Inside Story.
Well, we're going to get deeper into the legal and political significance of the court's decisions with our guest today. In Ottawa, Ardi Imsez is Professor of International Law at Queen's University and author of a new book, The United Nations and the Question of Palestine. In The Hague, in the Netherlands, Armand Abu Fool is an international lawyer and researcher for Palestinian human rights group Al Haq. And on assignment here in Doha, Akbar Shahid Ahmed, senior diplomatic correspondent at Huff Post. He's covered US policy on Gaza since the Obama administration. Welcome to all of you. I think I'm going to start with you today, Ahmed. You are there in The Hague. This is where this happened. But let's just take a few steps back, because I think people are aware of the International Court of Justice. It's doing this case under the Genocide Convention. I think there'll be some thinking, well, didn't we already have this story, it, it making its ruling in January? So explain what happened in January first for us. Well, thank you for having me again. In January, the decision on 26th of January was the court ordering several provisional measures, uh, de deciding that Israel is uh, committing, um, is plausibly committing the genocidal acts that it listed in, in that order, and ordered Israel to stop uh, um, uh, its uh, military personnel from committing these acts and um, uh, stop incitement to uh, genocide and allow humanitarian aid. Um, South Africa then went to the court again and asked for uh, other um, uh, provisional measures. Uh, and the decision for provisional measures of this time is focused on humanitarian aid and the humanitarian situation uh, in the Gaza Strip. Of course, in part, South Africa asked about consequences um, uh, on uh, other states, third-party states, but the court rejected uh, to answer this question for the simple fact that it cannot rule uh, on the responsibilities of states that are not party to the current proceedings. But on humanitarian aid, what the court uh, ruled, I think, was uh, pretty significant and different from what the court uh, ordered uh, before. First of, all, first of all, let me just explain. The fact that the court accepted this request, it means that, that the situation has changed and remains, uh, in a way, a plausible cause for genocide. It's an indication of the uh, deterioration of the situation, especially on the humanitarian front. While on 26th of uh, January, two months ago, the court called on Israel to enable humanitarian uh, aid. In this um, uh, ruling, the court is calling on, on Israel to ensure humanitarian aid uh, in cooperation with United Nations agencies and referring in particular to uh, allowing humanitarian aid by land, including increasing uh, uh, land crossings that uh, would allow humanitarian aid in the Gaza Strip. And I think this is a recognition uh, by the court of the necessity of allowing humanitarian aid uh, by land. It's also a slap to all Western states that are complicit in this genocide and try to whitewash their complicity by uh, dropping some air from uh, um, sea uh, here and there, thinking that a BR uh, can solve this, uh, this problem. Uh, but the, the ruling uh, also shows the evolution of opinion by judges in the court. So some judges that did not even vote for um, a certain provisional measures, including on humanitarian aid or, or other uh, situations, their position has evolved now, like Judge Sabudenti from uh, Uganda, who voted for the current provisional measures. We see also more um, uh, separate opinions by judges that shows frustration by the, by the judges. So okay. you have six okay. judges okay. now we'll, 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 yeah, we'll, 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 we'll discuss some of the details of what the judges um, are saying about this in a moment. But first, Adi, just before we get on, I want to go through the detail of the ruling with, with each of you in a moment. But how unusual... I mean, first, it's unusual, is it not, that this International Court of Justice is dealing with a case like this? It happens that it's the Genocide Convention, but normally they're dealing with pretty dry cases about, between countries uh, about treaties. But how unusual is it that the court comes just two months after one ruling and comes up with another ruling? Well, everything is going to be determined on the facts of the case, and the facts of this case necessitated, in uh, the view of the court, uh, uh, a revision, if you like, of the provisional measures. The situation on the ground has become much worse than it has been since the 26th of, of uh, January order was initially given. Um, and the court sets out the nature, uh, as your previous segment did, of the fundamental changes that have taken place, rather than, for instance, famine being merely a risk. 
it is in the court's view now setting in, particularly in uh, northern uh, Gaza. Malnutrition among children under the age of 12, two rather, is spreading unprecedented levels of food insecurity and so on. And so as a result of these, this fundamental change in circumstance, um, the court uh, viewed it as perfectly reasonable and within its uh, purview to respond to South Africa's request for a revision of the provisional measures order, which, which it did. Akbar, you're the non-lawyer on the panel today. Um, how do you think this will be seen diplomatically and politically before we go into some of the details of the ruling? I think there's a few important implications, James. I think the fact that the court is getting so specific about land crossings and the UN in ways it didn't kind of reflects the broader political conversation around this US-backed Israeli operation, right? The fact that we've gone from talking about humanitarian assistance broadly to saying how many trucks is Israel letting in per day, for outside parties to have to get into the minutia is a reflection of how much the Israeli government, six months into this war, is really being stubborn and mulish, right, in a way that other governments would not facing the scrutiny. So that's an important reminder. I think, too, this, this mention of famine setting in is really important because that gets us to a conversation not just about food, right? It's not just about calories. You can't throw food at starving people, which is what's happening. You need to get them medicine, right? They may die of malnutrition. So this opens up a whole bigger conversation, James, that I think international governments, international aid organizations really need to be having and are going to be leaning on this ruling to have. Ahmed, let me read you the very first part of the order. It says that Israel needs to take all necessary and effective measures to ensure without delay, in full cooperation with the United Nations, the unhindered provision at scale by all concerned of urgently needed basic services and humanitarian assistance. It goes on. We'll come to that in a moment. But that line about the United Nations um, comes at a time when the head of UNRWA, which is the main body um, uh, of the United Nations that's been delivering most of the aid, its head, uh, Commissioner General Philippe Lazzarini, wasn't allowed in to Gaza last week. It's not been allowed to deliver aid to Gaza. UNRWA has been demonised by Israel, claiming that its, uh, its people were involved on October the 7th, but has provided the UN no, um, um, no proof of that, no evidence. Um, do you think quite deliberately they're citing the UN in that part of the order? No, absolutely. I think that absolutely. This is the top court of the UN. The court relies uh, um, uh, profoundly on uh, the um, information it gets from UN agencies, and UN agencies and other agencies have been abundantly clear that uh, there is a famine looming in the Gaza Strip, and Israel is uh, the one responsible for impeding humanitarian aid. So the court is directly responding to the situation on the ground. Um, and as we mentioned, uh, it's, it's going in details what needs to be done. So it's also listing what kind of humanitarian aid need to be done, uh, need to be allowed to the people throughout the Gaza Strip. It, it reaffirms the need for this humanitarian aid to access the Gaza Strip through land, in a way saying that there is no alternative to that, and through United Nations agencies, in particular UNRWA. Uh, we have been uh, seeing and hearing several statements that uh, there is no alternative uh, for UNRWA. So I think uh, this should be a signal to all states that, uh, in my view, shame, shamefully uh, uh, cut funding or suspending fund, suspended funding uh, from UNRWA to review this decision. And we start seeing, seeing it happening. Some of these states have already uh, um, um, re restarted their funding to, to UNRWA, because, to be honest, the way this funding was cut is, uh, in and by itself, is problematic. Uh, these states didn't receive any evidence before suspending funding to UNRWA. They just entertained Israeli lies, a lie after lie. If there was any doubt that Israel has been lying for the past 75 years, a fact that we're, we, the Palestinians, are very familiar with, I think now it's obvious to the world that Israel pathologically lying, a lie after lie. Israel lies and the West uh, buys, and in my view, not because the West believes Israel, but they try to find any excuse for the monstrous actions that it's committing against the civilian population uh, in Gaza. Adi, as well as being a professor of international law, you're a former UN uh, official. Why do you think Israel is demonising the UN in the way it is? I mean, the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, has refused to call the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres. He's tried to... The Secretary General has tried to make calls to him since October the 7th, and he's not picked up his call once. Now you have this uh, attack on UNRWA. What do you think is the Israeli 
uh, strategy here with regard to the UN? Yeah, fundamentally, it's a politics of distraction. Uh, the Israelis have been under the uh, microscope of the United Nations for decades now in respect of the policies and practices they have been pursuing in the occupied Palestinian territory to settle that territory, to depopulate that territory of its Palestinian native inhabitants, to use torture against them, and now, now in Gaza to starve them to indiscriminately bombardment and the like. And because the United Nations calls Israel out, as it would most any member state uh, within its uh, purview, for these violations of international law, Israel is attempting to shift the blame or shift the story by focusing on the messenger being the United Nations. This is a longstanding practice of, 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 of Israel in respect of its policies uh, and practices in the occupied Palestinian territory. When I was legal counsel at UNRWA, I literally dealt for at least a decade and a half in trying to manage uh, uh, these these spurious claims. Um, and going back to the ICJ uh, provisional measures order, you know, one might ask what is going to happen next? Well, all one needs to do is look at what happened with the previous provisional measures order. On the 26th of January, with the last provisional measures order that was issued, within 24 hours of that order having been issued, spurious allegations against UNRWA staff, some 12 we were alleged uh, to have been told by the Israelis staff were alleged to have been engaged in the events of uh, 7 October, and that gave rise to all manner of withdrawal by Western states of support for UNRWA. So at a time when the ICJ called for the increase of humanitarian aid to the beleaguered people of Gaza, the starving people of Gaza, the Western states pulled out. And uh, so you see that there's this, this um, claim against the United Nations that is spurious, and it's part of Israel's management of the situation as a whole. Akbar, you're often based a, a, at the State Department in Washington. Um, let me ask you what, what, what the US view is of this, because on Capitol Hill, they are not going to fund UNRWA any time uh, soon. Uh, do they realise uh, the point that, we've, that, that, we, that we just heard from Adi, that these are spurious allegations? I think uh, Adi raises a good point that shooting the messenger is a tried and tested you know, tactic for diverting from the actual humanitarian situation. I think UNRWA as an agency is going to still face an uphill battle. That said, I think this ICJ order comes at a really interesting time for the U.S. administration because the State Department actually is facing a ticking clock for an assessment they have to do on Israel's provision of humanitarian assistance. By early to mid-May, the State Department has to certify whether they agree that Israel is making real efforts to supply humanitarian aid. Now, as has been mentioned, of course, the prior ICJ order also asked Israel, and Israel said, oh, we're doing a great job, right? And then famine was declared. This doesn't mean that there's going to be a magical shift, but it does mean that the public scrutiny and the pressure is growing. We've already seen since the ICJ order, Israel has out of the blue said, oh, surprise, we were able to let in nine World Food Program trucks into northern Gaza, right? So we're going to see some steps um, from the Israeli side, and I think it's really important for lawmakers, for officials, experts within the U.S government to say these steps are kind of drops in the bucket, right? So nine trucks is not going to change the scenario. The Israelis have also said, oh, well, we're going to rely on Palestinian plans instead of UN agencies and instead of UNRWA. That's really been roundly denied by all aid organizations, not just at the UN, saying that's not a way to distribute aid. So I think we're reaching a real crunch point, James, because if the U.S., cannot certify by mid-May that Israel is credibly delivering aid, there's a real conversation that has to start about whether U.S. military assistance for Israel and Gaza is even legal. And so while the U.S. can disregard international law, of course, they've loved to do that, right, for decades, this is U.S. domestic law we're talking about, and this ICJ order and what we're seeing in terms of conditions on the ground deteriorating feed into that whole debate. Ahmed, if you look at the second part of the ruling, it says, ensure with immediate effect that its military do not commit acts which constitute a violation of any of the rights of Palestinians in Gaza as a protected group under the Convention on Genocide. Uh, do you think this helps us in any way? Because, of course, the court... These are provisional measures. The court is still trying to decide the basic thing it's been asked to decide, whether there is a breach of the Genocide Convention. And I know you've read the individual opinions of judges. I mean, do, are we beginning to get some idea of their thinking on the bigger case here? 
Yes, um, um, absolutely. But if you allow me just uh, on, on Urwa briefly, I think the attack on Urwa is not necessarily on the organization per se, but what it represents. I think this is an attack on the Palestinian um, uh, refugees' right to return. And UNRWA represents the living memory for the war that the Palestinians still hold on to their right to return to their homes and villages from which they were ethnically cleansed by Zionist gangs in 1948. And Israel's colonial project wants to end uh, uh, this right by ending uh, UNRWA. On the an, an, case, an, important point, an important point. On the wider, though, on the wider case, the genocide case, do, do you get any, any, any feeling of, of where perhaps these judges are going now? Absolutely. I think we, we're witnessing an evolution of, of uh, uh, positions of judges. Reading these separate opinions, you see even the um, uh, uh, German judge, for example, seem to be leaning more uh, to the fact that it, there is a special intent for Israel to uh, that Israel is committing uh, genocide. It's important to note at this stage, the, the court is not asked to, to determine that Israel is in fact committing genocide, but to determine there is a plausible co uh, case for genocide. And this has been determined. And the, the court seem to be, uh, or the judges now, relying heavily on the fact that Israel is using humanitarian aid uh, to establish the genocidal intent. So not necessarily only the genocidal acts that have been listed in uh, the previous uh, um, uh, provision measure order, but now the fact that Israel deliberately uh, uh, preventing humanitarian aid and creating conditions calculated to bring about the destruction of the uh, uh, Palestinians as, uh, uh, as a group, in whole or in part. But also some judges refer to the fact that Israel has been using uh, uh, humanitarian aid, aid as a bargaining uh, chip, or the fact that Israel uh, has been uh, using humanitarian aid and not allowing it. So th th this, in, in, in a way, used by judges is an unusual language and give you an, an indication how the judges are thinking. Now we okay. have six l judges let, 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 me bring in our, let me bring in Adi now. Um, this order, one thing that's not in there is a call for a ceasefire. Is that something, Adi, they could have done if they wanted? Because I've hit, heard some legal experts say, no, it's not possible because Hamas is not a state and it's not represented at the hearings. Your view on that, please, Adi. Uh, quite right. You can see that based on the opinions offered by members of the court uh, and the majority of the court, you can see there's been a discussion between uh, the court on whether or not they can call for a ceasefire. And it appears based on that discussion, that members of the court do not believe that they can call for a ceasefire because one party to the conflict, Hamas, is not before the court, is not a state, is not a party to the proceedings, and therefore it would be folly in the view of these judges to call for a general ceasefire. Notwithstanding, there's a good number of judges, seven of them, uh, in declarations that they issued separately that call uh, for very clear ceasefire, that urge uh, and express dismay and disappointment with the fact that the court did not find it within its purview to call for a general ceasefire. Judge Yusuf, for instance, says all the indicators of genocidal activities are flashing red in Gaza. This can only be achieved to end it, can only be achieved through suspension with immediate effect of Israeli military operations. The Australian judge, Judge Charles Worth, in my view, she said the court should have made it explicit, the call for a ceasefire, precisely because it is the only way, in her words, to ensure that basic services and humanitarian assistance reach the Palestinian population. And so there clearly is, as was discussed earlier uh, by Ahmed, an evolution of the court more and more of the judges of the court are demonstrating that they're becoming impatient with the actions of the occupying power and require, in their own views, a ceasefire. Um, but there's a technical reason as to why the court uh, could not call for that. And the reason is that Hamas, one party to the conflict, is not party to the lawsuit. Um, I okay. think we need to take a step back, however, and not look at it so technically. Sorry, James. That we need to take a, take a step back and not look at it so technically. We know that the population is starving. We know that based on the United Nations, including the ICJ's views, famine is setting in. We also know that the occupying power is blocking humanitarian aid through at least six of its land crossings to the Gaza Strip, and that this, this airdropping is not enough. Um, there's no question that the reasonable person looking at the situation on the ground shouldn't be able to say that there should be a ceasefire, as the Security Council of the United Nations has already called for, and hopefully this, this opinion and the separate uh, uh, opinions of, of members of the court will help push in that direction. 
OK, it's worth noting that the International Court of Justice is still discussing an advisory opinion on Israel's long occupation. And there's another case coming up. Yeah. Nicaragua is uh, taking Germany to court, uh, saying it's participating uh, in the genocide. But then that perhaps, Ahmed, begs the question, what's the other very important court in the, in the, in the town where you are right now in The Hague? What's the International Criminal Court doing? Because they're the ones who are supposed to bring war crimes charges, aren't they? Absolutely. Um, it is our position as al-Haq. We made it clear um, on multiple occasions that it is long overdue for the International Criminal Court to start issuing arrest warrants. It is becoming abundantly clear that uh, the prosecutor of the criminal court, uh, Mr. Karim Khan, is dragging his feet. And we speak um, uh, of confidence because we possess the requisite information and documentation of such crimes that he has enough evidence to start issuing arrest warrants for Israeli war criminals, including military per personnel, but also leaders at the highest level, including Netanyahu himself. It is long overdue, and um, it is quite uh, uh, strange and shocking that until now we still don't have uh, these arrest warrants. But if you allow me just to, to clarify something here, um, I think the ICC understands very well that it can play all the diplomatic maneuvers at once. It cannot uh, uh, jump over p the Palestinian situation. So there will be arrest warrants. I am sure of that, and there will be arrest warrants soon. But the ways in which the court will move forward with this investigation is also of a particular importance. There need to be, I think, a particular focus on which uh, cases will be selected, which crimes will be uh, advanced, and I okay. think only time will tell uh, if I'm, the court I'm, will I'm, move... I'd like to bring in Akbar just one more time, if I can, uh, because I think not many people think that Israel is likely to comply. It's not complied with the, um, the, 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 the um, Security Council resolution earlier this week. Probably not likely to do this, comply with this court order. But do you, as you look at the diplomatic climate right now, do you see Israel more divided than ever? Is it developing pariah status quickly? Yeah, I think, James... Israel is under huge pressure at home and abroad, right? Prime Minister Netanyahu is deeply unpopular. The hostages are not home. Families are deeply upset. And Israel can't really count even on its closest friend, the U.S. So I think from an Israeli point of view, it's clear that this strategy and this approach to the war is not working. So while they can continue blocking aid, they can continue saying, well, next we're going to strike Rafa and be even tougher, there's still no answer from the Israeli side of how any of this gets any better. And that's what we need to see. And I think that's what the American administration is dying to see from the Israeli side, ideally from their perspective from someone other than Benjamin Netanyahu. But I think right now it's unclear how that change would occur within Israel, whether his government will fall apart, but all these outside pressures are really encircling Israel, and I don't see who's shoring them up at this point. I mean, you've even seen France now come out and say French Israeli soldiers could be liable under French law. So there's a whole network, there's a whole framework. U.S. war crimes potentially could be in implicated, right? There's a whole network of kind of allegations and potential prosecutions facing Israel that they don't have a good response to right now. Thank you, gentlemen. So much more to discuss. Sometimes I hope this programme, or wish this programme was an hour long. It's not. Uh, Adi Imseis, uh, Ahmed Abufoul and Akbar Shahid Ahmed. Al Jazeera has teams on the ground in Gaza. You can watch their reports and get plenty of analysis and context by going to our website, aljazeera.com. What should we discuss next time? Tell us on our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can also find us on X, where we're at AJ Inside Story. From all the team here in Doha, please stay safe and healthy, and I'll be back in this chair again very soon. Bye-bye for now.